All right, so let's talk about pressure. One particular property of a system. What is pressure? Is, is pressure what you feel uh, when you're about to take a test? Well, not really. That's not the kind of pressure we're talking about. We're talking about pressure that can be measured via a gauge. All right, so something like atmospheric pressure or pressure in a tank. So there's a couple of different pressure measurements, and you need to be familiar with them. Now, most of you probably are uh, particularly familiar with gauge pressure, PSIG. But if you go to outer space, that's what I'm trying to show by my first row of gauges there, a PSIG measuring gauge or a gauge pressure gauge will not help you very much because the pressure in outer space is zero. Right? There's, there's basically no molecules bouncing around there, and so that's zero pressure. Well, if you have an absolute pressure gauge shown in the middle column, your absolute pressure gauge will read zero. If you have a vacuum gauge, your vacuum gauge will read 14.7 PSIA or 101.325 kilopascals below typical sea level atmospheric pressure. Okay? If you take that gauge set down to ground level, so now we're at the base of the skyscraper, okay, and we've now got a regular gauge like you might use for measuring your tire's pressure. Well, if we expose our three gauges now, the gauge pressure gauge, the absolute pressure gauge, and the vacuum pressure gauge, if we expose those to the local atmosphere at the base of the skyscraper, well, then the gauge pressure gauge will say, well, there's zero pressure. What it's doing is it's saying there's zero pressure above and beyond local atmospheric pressure. Okay, the absolute pressure gauge will measure 14.7 or so PSI, depending on where we are, of, of absolute pressure. And the vacuum gauge will say, well, there's, there's no vacuum here. It's zero. Now, if we take our gauges and now dive with them and go under the, the, a lake or an ocean or a swimming pool, whatever, there's no point in bringing our vacuum gauge with us anymore. So let's just bring the PSIG measuring and PSIA, the absolute measuring gauges with us. And then we'll go down to a depth where the pressure gauge that measures in pressure above and beyond atmospheric, the PSIG measuring, it measures, say, 30 PSI. Well, the absolute pressure gauge will measure that plus atmospheric of 14.7, so it will be at 44.7. So hopefully you'll understand these. There are some equations from your text that are very useful. I would recommend you go find these in your text. You need to start becoming familiar with it anyway. They're easy to find there in the first chapter. I would highlight these. This is just how you convert between the various uh, pressure measurements. Now, most of the time in your everyday experience in industry, in your car's tire pressure, most of the time you're using a gauge pressure gauge because what you care about is the pressure that is above and beyond atmospheric. But it's important to understand that we live below an ocean of air. We live at the bottom of an ocean of air. And I'll stress that more a little bit later. Pascal's paradox is an interesting thing. It, most people's intuition says that the pressure at the bottom of a container of liquid depends on the shape at the bottom of that container. Actually, it does not. Now, you've probably learned this, but it can trip you up. Okay, So it doesn't matter what the bottom of the shape of the swimming pool is like. If you are at the same depth in one area as in another, the pressure that you measure will be exactly the same. The pressure just, if it's a, a static fluid, the pressure just increases linearly as you move down, of course, assuming that that uh, fluid is in a gravity field, and the pressure will be higher on the bottom of the fluid than at the surface of the fluid. So the pressure at points A, B, C, D, E, F, and G in my uh, uh, figure here are all exactly the same. The pressure at points H and I will be different. I don't know if you can read what it says on the, the screen, but there's some mercury at the bottom of this pool. Now, you probably don't want to go diving in it, okay? Because there's a couple things that will happen. Number one, the pressure increases a heck of a whole lot faster for the mercury. Uh, number two, mercury is just not something you really want to play with. Now, liquid mercury actually is not all that bad, but don't do it, okay? Uh, obviously, you're not going to. But the pressure at point H and I will be different. In fact, the pressure at point H will be higher than the pressure at point I. And the reason for that is that the mercury's density is so much more than the density of water. And so as you move down that same depth in the mercury and the liquid, the pressure in the mercury is going to start piling up a whole lot faster, right, because of the, the density of the mercury. Now, your author has a slightly different form of the fluid statics equation that relates pressure and elevation than what I have. He just has P equals rho GH. I, I don't like that, and the reason I don't like it is because it suggests that as the uh, vertical coordinate changes and goes higher, that the pressure goes higher. 
usually the way we orient our vertical axis is away from the, the gravitational acceleration, right? So gravity points down, our y-axis or our z-axis will point up. That's just what we do, right? But think about a submarine. As the submarine goes down on that y-axis and gets lower and lower closer to zero or smaller and smaller, the pressure is actually going up, not down. And so I prefer a change in pressure equals negative rho g change in height. So think about it this way. If the submarine changes height by 90 meters in the fluid, well that's that 90 meters if it dives is a negative 90 change on the coordinate axis. So now we've got a negative in the equation that cancels with the negative in the height change and gives us a positive change in pressure. That's why I like this form of the equation. It's the one I recommend you use. In fact, wherever your author has written P equals rho GH the first time in your chapter, I'd recommend you add this one because it's important to understand it. Now we can use this equation to understand how barometers work. When we're in the classroom, I'll show you the barometer we have. And basically a barometer is an interesting thing because it helps you understand a couple things, not only local barometric pressure, but the fact that we do live under an ocean of air. Now a barometer is a pretty simple thing. It's basically just a tube that's sealed at the, the end with mercury in it that you turn upside down into a bath of mercury. And what's so interesting about it is that even though gravity is pulling down on that column of mercury, it does not succeed in emptying out the, the tube. Now if you took this apparatus to outer space and you exposed it to the vacuum of space uh, and you still had uh, gravity, say you took it to the moon or something, gravity on the moon would certainly empty out that tube. And the reason is because what actually holds that mercury up in the tube is atmospheric pressure down on the surface of the bowl. So if we consider two different points, okay, let's consider the point at the top of the mercury in the tube and at the bottom of the mercury in the, uh, the surface of the liquid, the difference in pressure between those two points is uh, something we can calculate based on the height column of that, that uh, liquid mercury. So if you follow this through very carefully, what you'll notice is that the atmospheric pressure can be calculated as the density of the mercury times the acceleration of gravity times the height of that mercury column because we know that the pressure at the top of the column is close enough to zero to call it zero. But the pressure at the bottom of the column at the surface of the liquid in the bowl is atmospheric pressure. And so the atmospheric pressure basically determines how high the column will rise uh, or basically not fall in the tube. So what can we do with these equations? We can torture students. I mean, we can teach students. Have you ever seen a beast like this on a problem? It is called a compound manometer. Manometers are devices that can be used, uh, typically used for measuring relatively low pressure differences between two points. But a compound manometer is a manometer that has different types of fluid along the path. So you'll notice that we start off with water, we move into a mercury fluid, then we move back up into water as we move along this from point a, B to point A, then down into mercury again, and then finally up into oil and over into point A. Now, how could we calculate the pressure difference between points A and B? Well, I'm going to write down the compound manometer equation for you. It's pretty simple. Let's start from point A. Well, let's, let's consider the pressure at point A by moving from point B to point A. Okay, and let's think about it intuitively. So if we want the pressure at point A, we can represent it or write it in terms of the pressure at point B. So on the right-hand side of the equation, we write equals the pressure at point B. And then we're going to move down in water through height H5, which is 6 inches. Okay, How much does the, does the pressure increase? Well, it increases based or proportionate to the density of the water, the acceleration of gravity, and the height that we move through. Okay, so you'll notice rho sub w g h five there in the equation. So we've added a little bit of pressure. All right, imagine that we're diving through this. You're you're a diver and you're at point B and you start diving into the water. The pressure is going to go up. Of course, I'm assuming that we've got gravity acting downward relative to this graphic. Okay, now if you dive then and you continue to dive into the mercury and you dive through H4, which is six more inches, the pressure at that point will be exactly the same as the pressure on the other end of the bend. Now, let me explain what I mean. So we're, we're in the mercury, we've gone through H5, we're down at H4, right? We're at that bottom of 12 inches from point B. 
if we were to continue to dive down around the bend, the pressure would increase. But as we came back up, the pressure would decrease to where once we reach that interface beside, uh, between the uh, mercury and the water, the pressure at that point would now be exactly as it was on the other side. So we could have just skipped over from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Now, not all the way across this manometer, but going over close to where we've got the bottom of the 10-inch dimension. Okay. Now, as we continue on our journey upward, now we're moving up. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Let me not forget my terms in the equation. So we, we dove down through a height of mercury that is H4. Now we're on the other side of the bend, so we need to add pressure due to that mercury. So that's the density of the mercury, acceleration of gravity, times H4. Okay, so we're at the, the third term. We've just written the third term on the right-hand side of the equation. Now, as we go up in the water through H3, which is 10 inches, had to put it there under uh, the 10 inch dimension. As we move up, the pressure is going to drop. So we need to subtract pressure in this case. So minus the density of water times the acceleration of gravity times height H3. And now we're at the top of that 10 inch dimension. Again, we can just jump over that small u at the top and be at the top of the water mercury interface now, just near where it's labeled H2. Now, if we continue our dive and move down through H2, that 8-inch dimension, the pressure is going to go back up, so we need to add more pressure. So plus the density of mercury times the acceleration of gravity times height H2, and now we're at the bottom of that 8-inch uh, dimension. We can jump over the U close to the H1 at the bottom of that last 6-inch dimension. And now as we move up to the same elevation as point A, now we're moving through oil, but there will still be some decrease in the pressure we're experiencing. And so it'll be minus the density of the oil, whatever that be, times acceleration of gravity, times uh, height H1, which is the final 6-inch dimension. So what we've done is we've moved from the pressure at point B added and subtracted pressures due to fluid statics along the way until we reach point A. And I really like this approach. It's a very intuitive way to solve and consider a, a compound manometer. All right, so you'll notice here we've got uh, our good friend, the uh, uh, specific uh, density that I prefer relative gravity for, rho sub s, is 0.9. Now notice it's dimensionless. So what that says is that this particular oil has 90% the density of uh, water at standard condition. So anyway, uh, oh, we've also got the density of the, or the specific gravity of the mercury listed here as well. And you'll notice mercury is 13.54 times the density of water. So we can use all of this in our equation. Turns out there's actually a simplification you can make typically if you have the specific gravity of the various fluids in the manometer. You can factor out the density of water and just leave the specific gravity of the particular fluid that each term represents moving through. So that's how you solve a compound manometer problem. Why would you ever need a compound manometer? Well, these manometers can be used, as I said, for relatively small pressure differences between two points. But a lot of times, even then, you need a manometer that's, that's very tall. Okay? A compound manometer can be used instead uh, so that the manometer simply doesn't have to span such a large distance, say a couple of stories or something. Uh, instead, it can hang on a wall and be much shorter in height. So these are practical devices, but to be fair, uh, electronic devices are so com uh, common today, inexpensive and sensitive, that they largely replace compound manometers. Now, I have used a manometer. There was a time I needed to measure flow rate in some ducting in my home. Well, I wasn't going to go out and spend the, the money and go through the effort to, you know, say $100 to, to measure pressure difference between two points in duct work. Rather, what I did was I simply used a, a length of tubing that was clear, put some water in it, and voila, I had a manometer. I could connect one end to a port on the ductwork in one area that I added to the ductwork and the other to a port in a, another section of the ductwork. And just by measuring the deflection of the water once the fan was on, I could actually calculate the pressure difference between those two points. So this is something worth knowing. It's, it's interesting. It's useful in many situations. There are still manometers in industry. Not, not all uh, industries have completely gotten away from them. Sometimes they're just uh, very reliable uh, mechanical means for measuring pressure differences.